Okay, so hi everyone, welcome to Four Stages Summit 2021. This is the panel for diversity and inclusion in tech. So this panel, we have invited uh, a range of really uh, uh, really important speakers today and I'll, it will actually be hosted by Ms. Sheri Um, who is the General Manager for Public Sector Asia Pacific, Microsoft. Sheri's career spans a 22 year journey in the high technology environment across banking and finance, telecommunications, government and oil and gas industry across various management and global leadership capacities involved largely in business and organizational transformation. So Ms. Shiryong, you may take it from here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. What a super honor for me to be here at Force Asia. I'm actually really excited, very, very inspired that, you know, Asia's largest open tech developer community it started by a young lady. I admire her passion, how persistent it is for her to have that kind of vision to drive, you know, to where this community is today. So with that, I just want to start by saying kudos, you know, to brave women. And also thank you, uh, Force Asia, for broaching a very important topic today on diversity and inclusion in tech. As we all know, the start of this decade has a tremendous, you know, uh, shift in what's happening in the world. And we see a convergence of three very major trends. Number one, the digital acceleration has, you know, exponentially grown uh, in all the markets around the world in the midst of a pandemic. We see job disruptions um, in the markets, whether it's remote or physically. We see a range of, you know, calls for all of us to be moving in a, with a greater voice uh, in inclusivity, equity, as well as social justice. And more than ever, you know, in the midst of such sweeping change, you and I and the organization has an opportunity to really make a difference here. Today, I'm super privileged to be joined by a distinguished panel of leaders, women whom I call captains of their respective field, and more importantly, they are truly the change makers that inspire all of us to do more. We're going to have a conversation around diversity and inclusion in tech. We're going to touch on some very personal stories and more importantly, look at the biases, the discrimination or the barriers we see in the market today, in the world today, and how we can all collectively push ourselves to think outside of the box and draw on all the empirical evidence that exists today to help us identify, you know, promising errors where we can look at investment, where we can direct our leadership voices and focus, and more importantly, what experiment we all can conduct so that this will all serve as a remarkable engine of change. So with that, let me welcome my panelists, uh, Ms. Dong Big Hang. She's an anthropologist with an experience in international development. In her current capacity as Chief of Culture at the UNESCO, she's directly responsible for UNESCO's program with overall objective to safeguard the region's cultural heritage and foster its creativity. Throughout her career, she's expressed tremendous commitment to gender equality, cultural diversity, human rights, and social development. And recently, she's actually explored the interconnections between culture, creativity, and how that intersects with all that is going on in the digital world. So welcome, Han. Next on the panelists is Dr. Kirutika. She's a research scientist in the field of cognitive systems, learning and memory. Kirutika leads the education team at Science Center Singapore and make you know her dream and her vision and she's dedicated her passion to really make STEM accessible to the public, especially to the students and very importantly to the educators community. So welcome Dr. Kirutika. Last but not least, uh, the reason why we're all here today at FOSS Asia, uh, Ms. Hong, uh, is the reason why we're all here, right? So she's the founder of Force Asia, chairs the annual Force Asia Summit, organized this amazing open tech summit in countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, China, Sri Lanka, all the way through to Germany. She's also a board member of the Open Source Business Alliance in Europe and served as a VP of Open Source Initiative. Hong believes that free and open source is not just a way to exchange code freely, but more importantly, a collaboration model that will set 
example of how people around the world can come together freely to collaborate and solve the world's most challenging issues. With that, welcome home. See, friends, maybe I'll start with, you know, our panel discussion with a speed round. The recent events has a, been a very big reminder for all of us that persistent inequalities continue to pervade our society and economies. So as we seek more responsibility from companies and individuals in the whole issue of diversity, equality, uh, I'd like to start with my first question to the panelists. Uh, what, what are your most passionate top of mind topic when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Can we start with um, maybe Ms. Han? Uh, yes, I mean, for me, because coming from the culture sector, so inclusion of a diverse range of sector into the uh, tech uh seen is a very very interesting topic to me uh and this is something that we have begun to to uh explore here at unesco that's very very exciting thank you Ms. han uh dr kirukita so i think when we talk about diversity uh the most important thing is to make sure that different people are represented at at during the development right from the beginning uh, we always hear of stories where there are products that that are designed and then you know they, they misrepresent or misalign certain kinds of audiences and one of the reasons why that happens is because the stakeholders the, the, the diversity is not there right from the beginning so having that diverse uh, viewpoints on the table um, enables us to ensure that the wider population is represented when something goes out. I, I think that's an amazing, you know, very, very important topic when it comes to uh, when we're looking at, especially in the world of technology, where we hope to use technology to pretty much bring in the equality, uh, the design phase and the product development phase is very, very critical. That's where, you know, you've dedicated your passion to helping STEM in education. And that's where we, we want to kickstart from development phase to your point. Uh, so thank you, Doctor. Um, how about Hong? Hi, Sherry. Um, so um, may I uh, say that uh, I'm really glad to be here and uh, it's uh, it's right to see you all on, on the panel. Yes, I, I totally agree with Han and, and Kirutika. So diversity and inclusion, uh, inclusion is very important, not only in, uh, in the tech sector, but everywhere in our society, right? In order to whatever we do in, uh, in the tech industry, we want to be a product, we want to get it into the user hand and uh, we need to have the user view of points represented in the development phase. And without the, um, the, the diverse, diversity and inclusion in the way we work, in the way we develop, it's difficult to say that we can represent um, our user, we can understand the, the whole journey and, uh, and, and the opinion of the user. So definitely to emphasize again, it's really important uh, that we ensure um, uh, uh, an inclusive uh, environment in, in the tech industry. Thank you. Very nice, which is why you've been so passionate about championing open platform, open collaborations. Uh, so thank you. You know, for us at Microsoft, uh, I would say for me right now, uh, there is so much we have to do in the arena of diversity and inclusion. Uh, but currently for us, you know, one of our top of mind is how do we address the gender inequality? How do we also look at the space of uh, people with disability? So if you look at the UN Sustainable Goal, for example, it talks about how gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but more importantly, a very, very necessary foundation if we are all looking to enjoy a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable, you know, world. But yet in the arena of, you know, of what we're seeing today, especially post-COVID, right, we're seeing how women are, were among the most hardest hit when it comes to post-COVID uh, impact. And you're looking at a, a rate where the estimated job loss rate for women is twice higher than that compared to the males. And at the same time, you know, we talk about uh, Dr. Kirutika and Hong, you talk about how digital technologies today are going to be that backbone of the economies uh, for us to build a resilient future. But if you look at World Economic Report uh, uh, on Gender Report uh, 2020, it, it is 
it is a very, very stark realization that how women is actually underrepresented in emerging tech roles. Uh, we have very, you know, glaring statistics like 12%, only 12% 12 are re represented in cloud computing when the world is moving into cloud. And Hong, you talk about how without the right representation, you're not going to get the design phase and development phase right. In the same way, we know the involvement of data and AI, but there's only 26% of women representation in that field. So I, I would say, you know, from that perspective, uh, us at Microsoft are looking at how do we actually really bring in place the right programs and foundation uh, pretty much for women in the tech world. Uh, I hold that for, for a second. Uh, let me also maybe quickly share something that we're super passionate about. Uh, the world, the WHO estimated that about 15% of the world population, that's close to about a billion people, with, live with some form of a disability. And in Asia Pacific, you know, we're looking at one in six people has faced some types of challenges or uh, barriers to enable them to be fully participant in the economic arena in society. Uh, with this stark number, you know, we are passionate about what can we do, you know, really to take inclusion for the people with disability and it is very very telling that you know by excluding this population of people from our job you know workforce we're actually causing an impact of seven percent to gdp around our countries uh so maybe just just a quick start to kick start the discussion i, I just want to focus a little bit on uh, women as well as disability when it comes to inclusion uh, and start by sharing a little bit of what we are doing uh, at Microsoft. Uh, at Microsoft, you know, it is really our mantra to empower every person, every organization to achieve more. We specifically look at, you know, how do we, to Dr. Kirikita's point, STEM is an area where you start grooming, you know, pretty much talent in this arena. We're very, very intentional about how do we inspire young girls to one, uh, take up those, you know, subjects in their school, in education, and uh, then create programs where we can help them create, give them opportunities and environment uh, for mentorship and sponsorship. So we, we we have this program for what we call digital girls, basically going to schools and helping, you know, children equip them with the systems as well as the devices and the coaching to be able to learn and start coding from young. Uh, this is one uh, example. Uh, the other one I'll talk a little bit later is women in AI. We see we're very, very passionate. We talk about how only 26% of the populations are actually represented by women, but this is going to perpetuate in the product development cycle if we do not increase the representation. So we will be launching a program called Women in AI, really providing the ability to skill and learn, and as well as uh, take up uh, certification in AI and provide that internship and mentorship to bring women actively into the working arena from that perspective. Uh, in, in, in the space of uh, disability inclusion, we're looking at how do we drive inclusive hiring programs. And this may sound um, uh, 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 like, hey, it's part of the hiring program, but I, I urge all organizations out there to be considerate and cons you know, to consider approach in inclusive hiring to ensure that you create an environment and a platform where people with disability can have an equal, equitable opportunities in participating in this arena. And uh, just, just a point of uh, uh, interest, recently we have this uh, program uh, called Neurodiversity. This looks at hiring people with neurodiversity uh, challenges and basically, you know, to demonstrate that we, in the workplace can intentionally provide the right environment, safe environment to leverage and utilize uh, diverse skill sets. Uh, I think in the picture, you will see that Philip Jarvis in, um, in, uh, is, is an engineer that recently landed his dream jobs with HoloLens. So he is experimenting and working with HoloLens despite his uh, 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 disability and equally effective in participating in this. Uh, so those are two, you know, uh, arenas we want to really, really uh, uh, look into and, and invest into. Um, and with that, let me 
uh, turn the lens back to our panelists. Uh, you all come with amazing stories. You are trailblazer. Uh, can we maybe start with a little story of, you know, how you started in the tech community, how you get involved uh, and share with us, you know, something uh, exciting that happened in that journey. So maybe we start with uh, Dr. Kiwutika. Hi, okay. Um, how did I get started in tech? So I think I always wanted to do something in science, right? So um, being an investment best subject in school, and I was fortunate that there has always been opportunities for me. So at some point of time during my um, university, I managed to get an internship at a research institute. And then uh, following that, I, I landed a final year project that I enjoyed. And then, you know, that led into graduate studies and finally postgraduate and so on. But at some, at um, maybe around five years into my postgrad, I um, decided to make a bit of a pivot. And instead of focusing on um, doing research, I decided to move into the education um, field. And there were a couple of things that wanted me to make this change. Um, the first one was the fact that I became a mother. And mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, it, was, it was very important for me that my kids grew up in an environment where uh, education was moving very fast. And STEM education was something that, um, change so in the olden days when we were studying science when we were studying computing you know you literally had to do things where you know the, the question and the exam paper would be named the three parts of a computer and and you would have to say the three parts of the computer are the monitor um the cpu and the keyboard i do not know how many of you belong to that generation <laughs> so, so so literally that that's how it used to be and and of course today um things are very different and you have tools out there that enables anybody uh, to learn how to code and to get involved in tech and one of the tools and i think i think that this is something that i would i always like to say that my daughter my younger daughter learned how to code before she learned how to read wow. and that is and, and and it's not so much of the ability of a child you know and sometimes oh your daughter is smart but that's not true it's the fact that there are tools available today to make it accessible to someone that's very young. And I was totally fascinated by that idea. And what was lacking was the fact that, you know, while there are tools available, people are not aware of these tools. Someone needs to go out and tell parents because we are, we, are, we as parents, we as women, is like, okay, coding. I am supposed to be doing assembly language and you know that, that that's kind of what people have in mind you know um pages and pages of jargon and hexadecimal numbers that that make no sense to anybody but that's not what it is so so that's sort of how i pivoted and now i just want to um bring out a couple of things that struck a chord with me based on what sherry had shared a little bit earlier on uh specifically on women and uh Early, when I was a staff at the Science Center, I had the pleasure of hosting a hackathon that was run by a bunch of students. Um, and they were trying to do some um, work on hacking um, old electronics to make cool stuff. I mean, students love to do projects like this. It was a student-fronted project. And this boy, whom we had known, had got together all his friends and said, you know, we would like to use the Science Center. So sure. And, uh, what struck me was that out of that group of 25 students who were part of this hackathon, there were two girls. And um, they, they had a lot of fun. The students had a lot of fun. I was observing them. And at the end of it, the, the kids were doing reflections. And um, the girls stood up, one of the girls stood up, and she was almost crying. And she said, ever since I was a child, I had never had the opportunity to build anything. I have never played with Legos. Um, I had never built anything. And today I built this. She was maybe about 15, 16, I'll give or take that. And I stopped and I said, what's happening here? You know, um, 15, 16 year old girl in a generally good school in Singapore, never had had the opportunity to build anything before. And um, so then, then uh, sometime later, I watched this video, which I think has been floating around in social media quite a bit, where um, there is a girl child who is growing up. And as the child is growing up, uh, things happen in the way we speak to that child. You know, hey, princess, how are you? Uh, don't touch that big tool. Let your dad handle it. And, mm -hmm. and these things 
make very subtle. It's not that as a parent, we don't want our children to go into engineering. It's just that at the, as a parent from the very, very early ages, we have these little biases that implicitly sort of feed into our kids that, you know, I'm a girl, I should be not doing, I don't know what. So, you know, so, so, so these are things that I think, uh, I, I think I really want to change. And that's kind of why I am where I am. And I think I'm going to hand the time over before I start talking too much. <laughs> No, no, this is super inspiring, Dr. Uh, you know, you, you talk about the importance of advocacy. So many people just are not aware of the opportunities out there for that shift and that change in this arena. So thank you. Continue to champion that. And I really, really love your story about girls. I, you know, I just had this impression. We did DJ Dog Girls in Sri Lanka. And when we look into the eyes of uh, some of these kids, they're like, oh, you know, exactly the expressions that you just uh, articulated about how you know they've never built something now that they've experimented it they think that wow actually i can do it i have much bigger dreams and uh, i would really want to be there helping the other girls helping the other you know people who has never touched a computer who has never coded uh, so i love your inspirational story and it is super important uh for us not to put that conditional you know, lens uh, on our community, especially as parents, spot on, you know, sometimes we, we put that un un unconscious bias and that condition on. Thank you for that. It's super inspiring. And uh, maybe let's turn to Han. As for me, uh, I must confess that uh, I'm not a tech person. I, I have been working in my whole career as an anthropologist with very limited knowledge on text. But what, what has been really inspiring me and, um, and then to begin to explore these, uh, these uh, stories is, uh, so I mean, I, I've been working most of my career in the culture sector. And in the culture sector, we face a lot of challenges. And, I guess you all know it, there's like artists and heritage professionals have very low and unstable income. There are very little resources to support them. Country sector is a very poor sector, if uh, I must tell you, on the ministries, on the NGOs working on country are generally very poor. Artists are often struggling. Uh, there are very limited opportunities for networking with other people to receive new skills, um to to learn new things uh we see with our own eyes heritage are being damaged at a very fast speed uh and then if you are from the consumer user's point of view uh you also have uh, certain limited access i mean you would have access to more mainstream country products for example than the products are produced by more marginalized indigenous groups uh, and then when COVID took place, uh, started about a year ago, we see all these challenges are getting worsening very, very fast. And at the same time, we also see that how fast the country sector start using digital technology to maneuver mm. and to try to make the sector better, to gain a little bit more income by putting things online and things like that. So. So that's when we really see that, okay, this is maybe there could be a great ways to bring the partners from the country, from the uh, technology world, and also bring new business models in to really uh, explore something to make uh, the country sector a better place for, for, for everyone uh, to be. So uh, because of that, we uh, initiated this uh, initiative called Tech Car, Tech for Culture, but then if you say it is like Tech Call, the digital uh, the challenges that uh, that faced by the sector. So with this, we aim to provide a platform for all these different partners from different sectors to come together, to learn from each other, to network, to build capacity, and to develop solutions to support the country sector. So we started with this uh, first idea tone. A uh, very great honor to partner with Fox Asia for the first idea tone. Uh, and we, we we see some interesting interesting figures I was going to give you. So when we did the when we did the the uh, ideaton day, when uh, Kurutika actually gave a very uh, seminal uh, workshop. Uh, so we have 
443 participants joined and half of them are women. Uh, about 50%, uh, no, 40% of them are young. They are at the student's background. And uh, they come from 31 countries. Some of them are from areas that we would consider kind of a, a bit of the frontier in the technology world, like Bangladesh, Mongolia, Nepal, Uzbekistan. Uh, and then people come from backgrounds like culture. They are artists, actresses, curator, film producer, tour guides. They come from technology side, software, cloud engineer, web developer. And they, they come, they are students, professors, researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, government officers. So we really see a very diverse range of people. And so we are kind of also very hopeful that how with this uh, approach that we are taking by bringing different sectors together, we can um, kind of encourage this inclusivity and diversity for the tech world, but also, of course also for our culture, culture sector as well. So that's that's how we kind of started. And it's still a very early process in terms of UNESCO. Uh, in the power session, we are also having other other activities at the global level on looking at AI. Uh, and especially like, yeah, so I am very excited to hear about the, the uni, um, Microsoft uh, initiative on women and AI because we, we also uh, found very much of the same evidence that you have just uh, pre uh, stated earlier. Uh, so yeah, so so that was the process that uh, UNESCO is working on with experts to develop recommendations uh, for ethics in AI, and a lot of that was one of the main principles is related to inclusion and diversity. Very, very, very nice. Thank you, Han. Uh, you, you know, you talk about how hey, I'm working all my life in culture and not really in tech. Uh, but honestly, you know, we have a Satya Nadella said that you know, culture is strategy for breakfast so culture is so much so such an important fabric of you know our society and something that uh uh you know as we as every one of us make choices you know this this basically builds a culture and the culture basically shapes our world so thank you first thank you for the passion and the work that you've been doing and in this arena especially when you talk about hey you know uh we work with farmers in the rural area who are not very exposed to technology uh who has very little economic actually opportunity uh, this is really the era where we got to open up technology platform to give them two things right one technology to ai and technology to help uh, the farmers increase their productivity increase their ability to drive more sustainable production but more importantly with technology now they can have an openness to the whole marketplace to the whole ecosystem so your work in the respective culture i mean this is about farmers the same thing goes for fashion designers, for artists, they do not need to be limited to a small physical constraint of pretty much where they can sell or, or market their products and solutions, but pretty much open you know, the whole uh, global ecosystem to them. So thank you, continue to champion that work. Uh, maybe let's hear from uh, Hong. Yes, um, so um, my journey to, to tech, uh, to be well on it, I got a little bit related to um, what Kirutika said about um, access to, to tooling. So I actually did not get into tech until um, I was 20. Yes, you know, I grew up in Vietnam and you said even the like, people who live in Singapore feel that they don't get access to the right tool in country like Vietnam or India, uh, even like, more difficult at the time when I grew up. But I got um, into tech, I must say, again, even though I said it so many times in every conversation, it's all about open source. So um, uh, my first uh, interaction with um, uh, with open source was at the time when I did a translation freelance job in a conference where we talk about free technology and where I also met my, my partner, Paul Mario, who is planned to me open source. And after that, I got the, the initial idea. I started to um, connect with the local uh, Linux user group. Yeah, I went to some meetup at that time I remember that they did like uh, every Thursday meeting where they show people how to install different uh, like Ubuntu OS or Linux uh, Mint in, in, the, in their machine and I get to, uh, to, to the roof I start to um, connect with them and I realized that 
people in that group are just so passionate about what they are doing. Mm. At one point, when I come there, I never have like tech background before. But when I come there, uh, I remember one uh, member sat down with me for three hours, explained to me how to use the terminal, and it got me very excited. When you use the terminal, everything like become like so very like very fast. You can download software uh, so quickly, and you can actually see you give a command and something happened in the background, and it got me very excited. And uh, it, of course, not only that interaction get me into tech, but several like throughout the year um, uh, of that year, I realized that there's so much learning opportunity that open source can offer me. And whenever I meet an open source contributor, they talk so passionate about what they are doing. You know, I met so many people who contribute to the project for over 20 years and they're so excited. So when you go to do the workplace, a lot of things going on and sometimes you get trust with your work. But as soon as you ask them to ask about their open source project, they can talk to you hours and hours nonstop. And, and I think that this is something that, that's really cool. Like really cool. And uh, open source is not only about software, it's about open collaboration. Without open source, I would not be where I am today. I got uh, not only Force Asia, the, the reason why I started Force Asia, I want to show people, I want to show women out there that actually opportunity, there's so much knowledge, so much um, resources in this uh, like tech world that people are willing to share and uh, it can power, um, empower you to um, to grow your, your own career. Um, even I did not study in tech, I'm now working fully in tech industry and also got like some, uh, uh, I would say a proud achievement because I um, make post Asia sustainable and so, like over so many years and I got invited to join the board of director of the open source initiative. This is uh, the organization that safeguard the definition of open source based in the US. And I also got invited on the board of um, uh, open source business alliance because they actually want to hear, want to understand the perspective of, um, uh, of women. And uh, it's, I also recently got uh, uh, appointed uh, to join the IEEE uh, Standard Association. Wow. So all these opportunities would not come uh, 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 if I have not made my way into the um, tech industry and open source community in the first place. And I also want to, to, to say can what hadn't said earlier in the hackathon that we organized uh, a few months ago. So we see women coming from Cambodia, coming from Mongolia, places that really difficult to, to access, coming from Myanmar, but uh, the, the current time is changing so much. So internet had enabled us to do many things that we could not imagine before. And um, software technology is not only about coding and what Kigutika said, there's so many um, potential for us. And uh, I really think that it, the conversation is really important. It also a pathway, um, uh, the, um, the approach to raise awareness uh, to more people. Um, uh, Sari, if I may, I just want to, to mention one, one more program of Force Asia that we're doing because we also contribute into this uh, journey by organizing our own uh, coding program. Code Heat, we've been running this program for uh, many years already. So the whole idea is to get mentors, the people like more senior in uh, in the community to help the younger um, uh, students and developers to um, contribute to, to open source and learn a new skill. And last month, I think just last month, our last season, we got two women winners in the room. So every season, Every time we have uh, three brand rise uh, winners and the last one, we have two women coming from, from India. And I'm very proud that we um, uh, encourage and, and engage more uh, female uh, students and young developers into open source. Wow, Hong, I'm super, super inspired. You're really our hero, you know, here. It's just amazing to hear how you started with an innocent approach into a conference, tried something and got super excited about it. And then that just paved the way of uh, such an admirable journey right now. And I think a lot more people should hear about your story and your journey. And you're spot on, right? Um, today, we are in this arena where the physical boundaries have all been dismantled. We have an amazing opportunity right now to get equal access to uh, the community out there. And I think one of the most powerful thing that you said is how it's not just about coding, it's about open collaboration. How do we really need to break down the walls so that we can en 
able and encourage people to collaborate, make the voice out there very active. And as women, I really think that we have such an amazing opportunity to be each other's allies, you know, to, to help one another. And I would also say in my experience, uh, maybe just a, a, a quick opportunity also to talk about, you know, you talk about how you did not study tech, but you're now full career in tech. Uh, I did not study tech as well. I started my, I, I graduated with a business degree and I started my journey with this company called Lucent Technologies. Uh, back then in those era, is the authority, is the tech, you know, icon that is building uh, communications network, internet backbones, uh, switching devices, uh, uh, signaling networks to enable, you know, the mobile and physical uh, uh, data communications. So I got into that role, uh, Lucent, basically starting to do proposals. I'm just putting proposals together, but I really have an appetite to kind of like in, digest all types of information. So I read and read and read and read and learn. Uh, I, I just want to say that that really kickstart my journey into tech. And one of the biggest thing, I, I think Kiritita said that very well is, you know, don't put a limitations. I really did not start, you know, my school days on engineering topics. But today, I'm very deep into technology, into the architecture, and know more importantly how the systems of work and how technology can make a difference for people's life and our society. So that is super powerful. And I encourage all the women out there: do not put a constraint, do not put a lead for yourself. Uh, you have many allies out there who's willing to help and support your journey. And, and more importantly, you know uh, what. Han and uh, Hong is doing to create that open platform where women from all over the world, you know, can actually have an opportunity to code, have an opportunity to uh, uh, dabble into the tech world. The world that is in the making today is super digital, right? Digital is going to be every part of it. Uh, I, I would think one of the biggest thing is about courage, taking that courage, that first step, just like what Hong did. Uh, and more importantly, having that continuous growth mindset, always wanting to acquire uh, more information. And with open system, there's a lot of knowledge out there that you can freely uh, acquire. Uh, so with that, maybe let me just turn uh, in the interest of time uh, to a second question. You're doing a lot of things out there. Like, like it or not, the reality is that are still a lot of work for us in the arena of diversity and inclusion. Uh, like to hear what are the barriers uh, that you actually experience, the biases and the discrimination, and maybe some of the good success of how you overcome those challenges. I don't know, Han Hong, <laughs> Dr. Kiritita. Okay, maybe I'll go first. <laughs> okay. um, I think when we talk about challenges, uh, there there are actually two challenges which I think we face um, that gets people, um, not necessarily women, but everyone um, away from technology. And I think somewhere we need to address these two um, issues. Um, the first, of course, I think I mentioned this right at the beginning, is that this is too hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, now, we all know that technology is important. We all know that we, we can't, none of us can live without our smartphones. We have FOMO, you know, fear of missing out if we live without, without our smartphones. Uh, but we don't think that we have the ability to create with the technology that we have in our hands. We want to be consumers because it's easy. Um, again, a bit of a plug towards what we do at the Science Center. We always believe that um, everyone should be a creator of tech and not a consumer of tech. And many of the stuff that we do is actually geared towards bringing up that kind of a mentality. And uh, it's it's doable. And of course, again, the tools that are available, that amazing set of tools that are available to, that, that helps us to make this happen, right? The other thing, which is also a little bit concerning to me, is not that it's too hard, but should I do it? And mm -hmm. the question comes because, uh, but when we really think about it, right, um, I feel that this is a bit of an 80s mentality. Um, you know, uh, so, okay, I'm not a coder. I'm not an engineer. Why should I learn how to code with Python, for example, right? Is it, is it, is it even relevant to me? And then if we, if we kind of 
again, take a step back. Again, I, I did say that none of us can live without our smartphones. But at the same time, um, you know, can we just think of any job, you know, open, open thing where technology does not help us? Um, let's consider, say, farming. Okay, fine. The, the, the most lowest tech job that you would think of, and, and it's been around for, but we all know, and every day we read newspaper articles of about how farming is going high tech. You know, people are using IoT and robotics and farm bots, you know, to, to get your, your um, farming easy and, of course, to, to solve certain challenges in, in, in the farming community as well. Uh, let's think about um, carpentry, for example, all right? So when you're a carpenter, do you, need to, do you need to use technology? I mean, all I'm doing is cutting wood and screwing it together. Um, what, what do I need to know how to code for? And I just recently read this article about this um, Indian guy who, who actually is a carpenter who, who makes bespoke furniture, and he's using augmented reality to make his furniture more interesting and enhancing. And, and really, if you think of any job in the world, you know, human resources. I heard a story about how, um, I can't remember if it was Shopee or, or some other company where they're actually using, they, they're hiring HR people who need to know how to do big data analysis because they need to crawl LinkedIn to find headhunt, to headhunt people. So, so really, every job needs tech. So, so don't tell me that. I'm not working in technology. You are working in technology regardless of what you do. And tech can help us to, to make and do our job better. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we need to address. It's not teaching technology to technology people. It's teaching technology to people who, who, don't, who feel that they don't need to do technology. And to me, that's a little bit synonymous to um, Say in the early 90s, you know, uh, people used to go for courses to learn how to use Microsoft Word, um, and and you had to be have a certificate in typing or you know certificate in this to get hired. And nowadays, nobody bothers with stuff like this. And I think maybe two three years down the road, nobody's going to bother with whether you have a micro certificate in Python. You're supposed to have it. I'm sorry, it's it's like reading and writing. You just have to do it. You know? So yeah, so that's that's what I wanted to share. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the fact that you're talking about everyone should be a creator and with the tools and the technology on our hands, uh, the perception that, uh, you know, uh, I can't do it. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenge. Absolutely. And thank you for continuing to advocate that. Um, how about yeah. home? <laughs> yes, so I just want to uh, to continue what Kiru just said. Yes, okay, Kiru just, uh, I totally agree with you, Kiru. So um, technology, I think all the industry would benefit from, you know, from technology and everyone should learn and it's all about the mindset from the beginning. If we have more models like you who encourage their children right from the start, that would be so good, right? So we need to do more um, advocacy, more outreach. But another thing that I see as a challenge, uh, I work with many um, corporations, many, many companies, and I also see that the ratio in um, career development on the leadership uh, level. So you still see a lot of men like um, have a, uh, it, it, it seems like, so uh, you, if you look at report from, from the industry, there's still a lot of um, men that holding emotional position in, uh, in corporation. And of course, uh, I, I'm really glad to see that Microsoft doing uh, a lot into this uh, direction as Sherry already um, uh, shared earlier. And I also see, so I, uh, besides, uh, we, this is the first time I got to, uh, to, to meet Sherry, but before that I've been working several years with Sinho, and I just see that a uh, scene who um, like is a good like a, a, a role model a way that when people looking that women can also advance in in their career and there's opportunity in the leadership for for women and this had like been uh, the society had been putting putting a lot of pressure and uh, raise awareness across like industry and companies started to to make good effort to change this and this is something that we very happy about yeah so uh, uh, connect to that, I want to say that we need more role models. So we need uh, women to inspire other women 
And uh, this is a, a, a this is great to have the panel for discussion so that companies out there uh, take this as uh, an example and uh, do more, make more effort, uh, similar to to Microsoft in three A environment when people, where women feel comfortable. You mentioned about you have the program for um, uh, women in in AI, right? So if you look at Asian. Um, landscape a lot of uh, of countries they have uh, the pacific culture that make women like tend not to be so comfortable to to be around men so we have uh, if we if we could create an environment like specifically for women make them feel comfortable um doing what they are doing it also a great opportunity for for me um like in the in the force community of course i i did not uh, uh luckily i did not uh, experience a discrimination while working with the force asia community but i also heard story uh, from other people and at the end it's all about um the misperception uh, misunderstanding because the way uh, some people communicate might not um, uh, be served as appropriate to some other people so the cultural uh, sector cultural factors i also see is as a barrier and this is something that we um, need to uh, tackle as well and this is linked to to han who really an expert uh, in culture and you perhaps you know i'm really inspired to see all the um, team members in your office actually are women coming from everywhere perhaps you can <laughs> Jim in and, and, and share with us the story there. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Hong Fook. And yeah, I completely agree with the challenges that Hong Fook and Kirutika had just uh, uh, mentioned and uh, previously Sherry as well. Uh, and before, uh, just very quickly, I would like to point out to the link that my colleague Misako Ito just put in on the, on the chat there about a video of, of uh, the link to a video that UNESCO has made on gender and AI. So maybe after the panel, you are very welcome to have a look. Uh, and uh, so in terms of challenges, I'm gonna shift gear a bit. Uh, of course, yeah, we, we hear the challenges about how women can, uh, yeah, uh, in relation to tech. And I would like to maybe bring in maybe the, the, the challenges for people who are not the tech people. But now, as you see, everything is digital now. You cannot really miss the trend anymore because, I mean, if we are not on it, then you would be very behind. And we have already seen how technology has made great implications for cultural and artistic expressions. Uh, you start seeing AI producing artwork. I think you will all know about this uh, artwork, the next uh, Rembrandt. I think Microsoft was involved as well, right? So, uh, so, and and eventually, I mean, if um, I think it's a great experiment, by the way. But then it also raised certain questions uh, about future of the arts, whether a human will be making it or we will be having machine making it, and then also rise and remuneration of artists as well. And so if everything was being put in the hand of the tech, and so what would be the, the for the culture sector, what would our artists, what would our heritage professional have the role in it? So I think the access to for the culture sector and and with this, I, I, I think would be equally important for agriculture sector, for health sector, for all these other sector as well, not, not just the culture sector, uh, to how to, to have access to all these tech opportunities, how they can also be trained in all these tech skills. Uh, of course, I mean, if they had opportunities to learn STEM from their young age and later if they come become an artist or they become a heritage person, they already have that STEM knowledge in them. But then a lot of the countries do not have opportunity to offer STEM to young, young, young children. And so they would grow up, they would become artists, they are struggling because artists own struggle and then they have to try to maneuver on this digital war and if they are not fast enough and then some tech person would come in and run away with it right so so how to really provide access to the culture sector or to any outside sector to learn about all these skills and knowledge about all these uh, financial opportunities on the infrastructure and equipment and more importantly i think the opportunity to really work with the tech people because at the end of the day it's not really you compete cultural sector compete with tech sector to see who would produce the nicest artwork right but i think the 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 um 
the, the future, I think, is I really would like to see the stronger collaboration between the sector and who will provide this kind of collaboration. Because to be honest, for me as a country person, when I look at all these topics that Hong Fook is organizing under this summit, a lot of them look like foreign language to me because I'm not really a part of this world, you know, and I could I could say that probably 99.9% .9 of people in the country sector would feel the same way. So where do we start, begin to pave the way to start including other people? They would never replace the tech people, that's for sure. But then how how they can start beginning the, the common language so that they can work together the, with the tech people. So I think that that is uh, something that we would really like to explore further. It, this is super exciting. I feel like we got so much to talk about, but unfortunately, time is running out. Uh, so maybe just a pause of a second, and I want to sum up, you know, all the great uh, insights that our panelists have uh, provided. Uh, any questions from the public chat group um, that we need to address? Yes, Sherry, I think that we have a number of questions. Do you see um, also the share notes? I saw quite a number of questions already. Uh, somehow, oh yeah. Oh. Shall, shall we take maybe one, two questions? Um, let's see. I'm super, super excited given we have so much great insight from here. Um, I am scrolling through the chat. Uh, Sherry, so it in uh, the share notes, the question, so if you see um, on the left side, you see notes and there is the option share notes. People putting have been putting their question inside there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Got it. So how about you? You know, a lot of question on diversity, half of young women. I, I think we can, uh, Sherry, can. Um, yeah, I think that there is. Uh, we take one or two, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, people are still typing, but I think there is an uh, easy one we can start for us. There are so many technologies. I do not know how to start. What do you recommend for students who are in school? Uh, that's a good <laughs> question for Kiru. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's my favorite question. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, so um, for for students who are in school, there is a suite now, and a suite is a growing suite. Um, so there is, um, it's, it's certainly not an exhaustive list. So for, for starting how to code, um, I think there are a couple of platforms. Um, my favorite one for the very, very young kids, the four-year-old uh, in us, um, is uh, actually Microsoft's Kodu um, platform, which is a little um, very visual programming thing. So my daughter actually um, learned her first code in Kodu. K that's K U D U. Um, and then um, there is the the more the open source um, option. So we've got Scratch, which is from MIT uh, Media Lab, very commonly used in schools to to teach kids how to um, get started in coding um, as well as computational thinking. Um, there is also, so, so when we talk about coding, we also should not um, sort of ignore the hardware um, options that are around there as well. So um, my, my favorite boards in that order is actually the Makey Makey, which is a very simple board to interface um, any kind of code to um, a physical environment and that really excites kids. Um, we have the Microbit, which is, really grown in popularity over the last three to four years um, and then um, following that we have the Arduino um, program. Um, there are a lot of block-based coding um, uh, opportunities where you actually can code without coding in that sense without really like writing any syntax um, other than scratch uh, and, and the block-based um, environments have actually moved very far. Uh, so something like scratch can only get you to a toy um, product in a sense. Uh, but there are tools like um, Tunkable. My favorite is actually Tunkable. Tunkable is actually an app development environment. And at the end of the day, you can actually do a functional app that you can export onto an Android um, phone and distribute it so that you know you can share your app with your friends. And, and literally anyone can um, can use Tunkable. Um, so, so there are really many tools here. <laughs> Just so much, and I, I just sorry. It, uh, we have three more minutes, and I wanted to get yes, I know. 
one close. But before I go there, you know, uh, I would say go to LinkedIn.com, right? That is a whole series of what we call digital foundations. And to uh, Han's point, everybody needs to uh, kind of like embrace tech. Doesn't matter if you're an artist or you're a taxi driver or, you know, you're a teacher. So I would encourage you to go to LinkedIn.com. We're giving a lot of free courses, uh, basically, and you get certified. So you get a, a journey into tech, not just, not just awareness and no knowledge uh and also watch out for maybe my linkedin where we're going to publish a very very large initiative called women in ai we're giving skilling certification program for free uh to encourage women and i you know there's a very very good uh, question on the panel uh on, on the list for all our panels to close with it says what is the one change you want to see now that's very practical. Uh, so I love to hear from that. For myself, the one thing I want to see now is the rise of women in AI because it starts to grief point, you know, from the development phase. If we are able to release a large pool of women in into the tech world, uh, you're gonna see a change in the end product that is that is designed. You're gonna change and see a change in the representation of women in uh you know top leadership in in organizations you want to see a change in those statistics that needs to move so i would say women in ai watch out you know click in take up the courses is for free uh you get certified and then you know move into uh, uh economic uh, or employment opportunity so maybe hand and home and uh kiru just one thing you want to see as we closed uh for change now uh Yes, I, I mean, I would definitely send my artists to go and train at your Women in AI uh, course. So thank you very much for for notifying us about that. And for us, for, for me for, and for, for, for our work here at the country unit at UNESCO Bangkok, we would really like to see how we harness the digital technology to, uh, to uh, make the sector uh, more resilient and more sustainable. And we would really like to see that as an equal partnership between the tech partner and the culture, uh, culture partner. So that's that's really the biggest aim for, for our program, uh, Tech Car. Love the partnership. Home? Yes, so the same for, for me. I also want to see more uh, partnership between Force Asia and other organizations and companies to run more programs uh, for women to learn about open source technology and contribute into different open source projects. Yes, so we're doing the program for many years already, and we invite uh, companies and partners by the UNESCO uh, to, to join hand uh, with us and uh, bring more women into open source. Thank you, Kiritita. Um, for me, the what I would like to see is to encourage more people to attend events and programs like Force Asia. Um, that's where you get to learn what is out there and to actually lose that inhibition that stops you from getting on board technology. Thank you very much. I'm super inspired. Thank you. You know, we all talk about advocacy, you know, uh, uh, taking away that condition, uh, uh, that, that limitations that sometimes we put on ourselves and be exposed in events like this to, to know that there is a world of opportunity awaiting for all of us. And all of us can play a big role in uh, changing and shifting the diversity and inclusion index in the world. Uh, this is a very powerful mission for all everyone on this you know, forum, we want to see change. We want to see change for a more inclusive and better society, you know, for our generations to come. With that, thank you so much, our great panelists. You're all superheroes. Continue to be role model out there, uh, you know, to inspire more to come. Thank you with that. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the panel. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Han, uh, yes. Sherry, and Kiru. I know that we are running out of time, but uh, there's still quite a number of questions on the channels. I wonder if we can <gasps> type the answer so that people can get the yeah. answer for the question. I think there are a few questions uh, related to Microsoft and a few for uh, related to Tech Cool. So um, I would really appreciate so the audience can get the answer if we type the answer. There. And, and, and continue to reach out to us. I am sure we are all, you know, uh, on LinkedIn, continue to reach out to us and we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, after this, we will all go in and uh, ensure that you get the answers. And thank chat. you very much. Thank you. And, and thank you for the great opportunity and congratulations. Uh, you know, we're all super inspired by the work of Force Asia. Thank you.